Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, the ASC 730 Safe Harbor Directive, Benefits for Taxpayers Claiming R&D Credit. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams R&D Tech Services Group, Star Fisher, Partner, and Ray Esquivel, Senior Manager. And Star, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. Great. Thanks, Emily. Thank you all for joining us today. Our primary objective of this presentation is to provide you with up-to-date information regarding the IRS administrative policies surrounding the R&D credit. In this presentation, we will cover an IRS directive that was issued in September of 2017 that allows certain taxpayers a safe harbor of qualified research expenses. These expenses must fall under ASC 730 on GAAP audited financial statements. We will cover an overview of the IRS directive, an overview of the qualifications under 730, as well as which expenses are covered under the safe harbor. We will then provide some calculation examples and a couple of scenarios to evaluate practical considerations. So what is this directive? This directive was published by the IRS in 2017 and it applies to tax returns filed after September 11th of 2017. The real idea behind this directive is that expenses identified as R&D expenses and classified on audited financial statements have really already been reviewed and tested by an external financial statement auditor. Therefore, some of these expenses are not considered by the IRS to have a high risk of adjustment. This is basically a tool that allows IRS examiners to focus on what they have determined to be the key issues with the R&D credit and not focus on areas that are considered low risk to them. The IRS is not stating by law that these expenses are eligible for the, the credit or that, you know, that they're really good expenses. They're just saying that these expenses are eligible for a safe harbor, um, that, that they don't want to spend time examining uh, just from an administrative efficiency standpoint. What are the qualifications for this directive? In order for a taxpayer to consider the safe harbor treatment under this directive, they have to be considered an LBNI taxpayer. 
And a large business and international taxpayer is defined as a taxpayer with assets greater than or equal to $10 million. They also must be reporting and separately stating R&D expenses on their U.S. GAAP financial statements. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be, the expenses don't need to be labeled ASC 730, but they have to be labeled something that indicates that they are, are qualified for R and, as R&D expenditures. Overview of ASC 730. The definition of research and development under ASC 730 is very similar to the tax definition under the Internal Revenue Code Section 174. You can see the actual definition here, but basically it is expenses where the intended result is a new or improved product or process. It can include expenses for labor, subcontractors, intangible assets, and certain computer software costs. Not all of these costs that are included in ASC 730 are eligible for the R&D tax credit, but as we'll walk through this presentation, you'll see kind of the reconciliation of how you get from qualified ASC 730 costs to expenses that are eligible for the R&D tax credit. Here are some examples of qualified activities under ASC 730. Um, there's a lot of specific examples here. Again, it kind of gets back to that new product, new process development. But it could be laboratory research, conceptual formulation, testing, modification of designs or formulations. It can include design and construction of prototypes. Um, tooling is, is a big area. And so it, for those of you that have claimed the R&D tax credit, these are all items that we would also look at for that. So it's a very similar um, definition. Please note that, the, that this does not include internal use software development. Um, internal use software development, which is software just for internal use of a taxpayer, not to be sold or, or licensed. Um, would fall under a different definition uh, under ASC 350. And that brings us to our first polling question. Okay, our first question is, does your company separately disclose ASC 730 expenses on your GAAP financial statements? And your options are yes, no, or not applicable. We do not have audited financial statements. And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond to participate in our polls today. Please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. Give everyone a few more moments here. And let's take a look at the results. Star, back to you. So it looks like about almost half and half um, of those who have audited financial statement and those who don't, or, or those who are not reporting it, sorry. Um, so that's a good mix. I think for those of you that said no, you're not reporting or separately stating ASC 730, if you do have R&D expenses, it might be a good time to revisit making sure they're classified in the right way so that, that this directive could be a benefit and you can get some of your R&D expenses safe harbored. For those of you that do not have audited financial statements, um, this might be an opportunity to still look at it the same way. If you have a reviewed financial statement, um, might not fall under this directive, but it is our anticipation that the IRS examiners are still going to want to, to look at when they're auditing um, a taxpayer, they're going to want to see that correlation between what's been reported on, on your trial balance and what's being claimed on your tax return. So there still might be some applicability here. It just wouldn't be this actual certification um, process that we're talking about. That, I will turn it over uh, to Ray Esquivel to cover more about the directive. Excellent. Thank you, Star. Um, so what we wanted to walk through on this slide was give an overview as far as the documentation that uh, would be required under the directive. Uh, methodology. The, uh, the language of the, of the directive spells out these uh, listed items here on this slide as far as um, those documentation items that could be requested uh, and uh, by the examiner should the credit be uh, looked at in the future. Um, so these are the things that, the, that at a bare minimum that the taxpayer is going to want to have available um, if they choose to utilize this directive methodology. So, um, I think the first one 
is fairly obvious in that uh, because of the requirement of utilizing GAAP on the financial statement, um, the first one would be just the, the actual financial statement information to begin with, um, along with any of the chart of accounts and the accompanying ASC 730 or and amounts that go along with it. So being able to map that out and showing what uh, the, is the composition behind that ASC 730 R and D number will be will be paramount as far as uh, being able to demonstrate what's included in the company's uh, The other big one here is the the organization chart. Uh, we'll walk through that in terms of why that's important in a few slides here. But essentially, we want to be able to show the hierarchy involved with the employees uh, working on the R and D uh, who is. Uh, going to be doing the direct day-to-day -day research versus first-level managers versus upper-level managers. So also wanted to note uh, just some definitions that are included in the, in the uh, directive that uh, gives guidance around who should be included and at what levels. And so it's important to remember uh, these specific definitions because I think this is going to drive much of the, the benefit that comes from the qualified costs uh, uh, that utilize, uh, that come from utilizing this directive methodology. So, um, again, this, this language is straight out of the directive and, and, and how they're looking at um, the qualified individual contributors who are doing the day-to-day -day research. So, what we're looking for there is those employees um, who do not manage any other taxpayer employees and whose wages are charged to that ASC 730 financial statement. In addition to that, we're going to want to be able to see who are the folks that were managing those qualified individual contributors um, and, and no one else. So um, the key point being there, that direct relationship as far as the input on the R&D side of things, as well as um, those being uh, derivative from folks that are charged to those ASC 730 uh, accounts. Lastly, for any of those other um, upper level managers, so people that manage the first level supervisors, um, those are the folks that we're going to want to identify as well. Um, so those, those are, uh, are defined as anybody who's supervising uh, any employee other than those of the qualified individual contributors. So again, we're going to want to make sure that those folks are um, charged to those ASC 730 financial statement cost centers um, and, and, and identify it that way. Sorry, do you want to walk through the um, yeah, yeah. application? Yeah, so, uh, sorry about this, guys. Ray is experiencing a fire drill at his office building. Um, had some bad luck there. So I'm going to do my best to get through his slides. I, I didn't, did not prepare um, for his, so please bear with us. And again, we apologize for, for the interruption. Um, Ray, please join back as soon as, as, soon as you're able. Um, so the Safe Harbor application to qualified research expenses. And so this is, this is kind of a, a reconciliation of what we would claim for the R&D tax credit and what would be safe harbored. So the first one is wages, and so th does the safe harbor apply? Yes, it applies to employees who wage whose wages are classified under ASC 730 cost centers or departments. So this ver is different from the credit um, in that this is looking at a cost center or a GL account versus by person. Um, this could be definitely advantageous to taxpayers who are classifying their R&D by GL account versus by person or by project, um, which we run into to quite a bit. The difference here with the safe harbor is that in order to safe harbor it, you, you basically get 95% of people actually contributing to R&D and also first level supervisors. So you kind of, if those people would have normally been 100%, you are taking that haircut on 5% of the overall qualified wages. However, you also get this upper level supervisor manager, which would be considered second level supervision, um, typically for the credit calculation, and so we would not include it. So you're basically trading 5% of, of contributors and first level managers for 10% of upper level managers. Um, 
you can, there is a, a way where you include 100% of the wages in the, the cost centers and then not claim the upper level. So you, there is a choice there and it kind of comes down to what would be in the best interest for your particular calculation and maximizing results and maximizing the safe harbor. Supplies also qualifies for both the credit um, as well as the safe harbor treatment. Um, really, there, there's not too many difference, differences. Um, prototype overhead expenses may or may not be included in the credit, um, but they are definitely not included in, in the ASC 730 safe harbor. Um, so they have to be used in the U.S. as part of the research process. So again, it would be classified first as ASC 730, and then we, we would get those uh, general ledger accounts to reconcile it to the credit claimed on the tax return. Computer leasing costs are also um, treated as safe harbor under this directive. And where we typically, the computer leasing rules were written a long time ago, but where we, we see it happening um, in today's world is with cloud uh, computing costs, AWS costs um, related to development efforts, those fall under the definition of computer leasing. And the last one is contract research, subcontractor expense. And under the safe harbor, contract research is, is excluded. So that does not mean you cannot include it in the credit calculation. It just means that it's not going to be a safe harbored expense. And the reason for that is it is an IRS um, focus issue right now, looking at subcontractor expense and whether or not you as the taxpayer are eligible to claim those expenses or if, it, if the credit would belong to whatever subcontractor you're contracting with. So they have removed those from safe harbor treatment. So really what you're looking at, the bulk of it is going to be labor costs and supplies that get treated um, as safe harbored. So what this directive does is it, det it details out an extreme amount of detail the reconciliation between your financial statement R&D and the amounts reported on your Form 6765 with your tax return. And it doesn't necessarily you know, prohibit any amount being claimed on your Form 6765 for tax purposes, but it separates what, which expenses would receive safe harbor treatment and which expenses would not. And so the, the, what the, the directive walks, you, walks the taxpayer through is, is how to, to calculate. First, you adjust your ASC 730 in one appendix, and then you calculate the labor um, qualification in a separate appendix just to account for that 95% or 10% of upper level supervisors. That brings us to our next polling question. All right. Our second polling question is true or false. Applying for certification under the ASC 730 directive allows taxpayers to safe harbor the entire amount of R&D credit claimed on a tax return. And your options are true or false. Uh, as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit today, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And I want to apologize for the uh, background noise, uh, unfortunately, there's a fire drill in the building that Ray is in, um, so thanks everyone for hanging in there with us. And thank you to STAR for taking over. And with that, we'll go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Okay, it looks like most of you got this right. Um, applying for this certification under ASC 730 directive does not allow um, the, R, the entire amount of the R&D credit to be safe harbored. It will basically safe harbor a certain amount of the expenses, but also doesn't take into consideration things like the fixed base percentage or, or the a, alternative simplified credit base. Um, those are, will be looked at separately. All right, so well, the first appendix in the directive is Appendix B, and this is just the beginning of reconciling um, the amounts claimed as ASC 730 on financial statements to the amounts claimed on the Form 6765. 
So here you can see kind of the steps involved. So you start with wages, which is actually, um, the actual detail for that is completed in another appendix, but you start with what was claimed on the ASC 730 financial statement um, adjust in, in from Appendix C, and then you add additional QRE amounts um, for accounts not included in ASC 730. So what that means is, is say you have some accounts on your financial statements that are labeled or identified as R&D or as ASC 730, that would go in column A. Um, and then if there's other accounts that were not included in that adjusted uh, or in that ASC 730 classification, they would be added here. And then in C, you will add amounts that are not accounted for anywhere um, in, in ASC 730. So this might include um, people that were just not included in that cost center that, that maybe a portion of their time um, is actually qualified, or materials or subcontractors. I, what we're seeing will go in column C um, most the most is when you're doing any uh, R&D related to customers, uh, cus under customer contract. So that would typically be in either in construction and process or work in process or an in inventory and really wouldn't be part of the ASC 730 presentation on the financial statements. Um, so this, what this allows you, what column C allows you to do is to add expenses that you are saying are not safe harbored, but you would still like to claim um, for the R&D credit on your tax return. So this is what Appendix C, the start of Appendix C looks like. And this really walks you through all of the numbers um, to get to, to adjusted ASC 730, Financial Statement R&D. So you first start with what's just claimed um, in total as ASC 730. And this, although this is one uh, category, this could be made up of several different accounts as long as, again, as long as they're either identified as ASC 730 accounts on your financial statements or they're labeled engineering, design, R&D, something that would indicate that they would be ASC 730 costs. Um, there just has to be some, some way of identifying those. Then you, uh, the first step is you just subtract any amounts related to foreign entities. So if there is any foreign subsidiaries or entities that are being included in that, you would take that out right away. And then you get to US ASC 730 financial statement R&D. And then from there, there'll be some more subtractions, which is on, on this next slide. So you, this basically reconciles what expenses might be included in ASC 730 that would not be a part of the R&D tax credit calculation. So these are things that would be taken out regardless of whether you followed this directive or not. Things like depreciation, amortization, shipping, travel, training, rent, overhead, all of these costs would not be eligible under R&D credit anyway. So they would, the directive does not affect that eligibility. It's just basically a step to take those out. And then this is the big one, number seven, um, is any R&D costs that are included in ASC 730 where it was done under a customer contract or another, or another type of funded contract. Um, these have special rules with respect to the R&D credit, and it is an IRS focus area right now to look at these contracts on, on who has the risk and rights of the research. And so although we get to add these back in to the to R&D credit calculation at the end of the day, the IRS is saying we are not going to allow these to be safe harbored. So what that really gets you down to is that you're claiming for safe harbor treatment only costs that are internally funded. They're not they're not going to be paid for by anybody else. You know, at the end of the day, you might develop a product that gets sold, but until you develop that product, there is no contract. And so that's really what this is getting to. And this is the one that kind of makes this not as much of a benefit for a lot of um, our clients, at least, because they are a big part of their R&D is work that they're doing for customers. You also will remove um, any the number eight is just subcontracted costs. So any costs that were included in the financial statements that were uh, paid to someone else to do R&D outside of the organization. And then you'd also remove any foreign um, expenses. So these would be R&D expenses that were performed outside the United States. So if, if 
you have employees in a different country that are doing um, work on behalf of the company or any, any supplies that were consumed outside of the country, um, those would be removed. Again, these would also be removed in the general uh, credit calculation, so it's not an additional step. And then number 10 is just any prototype overhead expenses, patent costs, severance pay. These would also be removed in the traditional uh, method for, for calculating the credit. So it's, it's nothing, it's not a, a new concept. It's just something that would be included in ASC 730 that would not be included in the R&D tax credit calculation. Appendix C is very long, as you can see. Um, the, the next part is, you, is to look at the wages. Um, so you would, what happens with this directive is you subtract all the labor, but then you put it back into the safe harbor treatment just using a different calculation method. Um, and this goes back to kind of what we talked about before, is you look at all the people that are, were involved in, in R&D and classified or allocated to um, ASC 730 R&D accounts. And you would take, you would evaluate them, and you would say, are they individual contributors? Are they actually doing direct R and D, or are they directly supervising that R and D? If so, you would include 95% of them. So they'll probably be included in the ASC 730 account at 100%, and we would be taking 95% and using their Box 1W2 wages to do that. So also converting whatever labor allocation was in ASC 730 to using federally taxable wages. You also would calculate the upper uh, manager's limit, which we will cover in the next slide. And then that becomes, gets added back into your, your safe harbor bucket, as, and it's, uh, they labeled it adjusted ASC 730 financial statement R&D, which would include labor supplies that, you, that was calculated on the previous slide. And this is Appendix C, so this is kind of what it all summarizes up to. You end up with your, your wages that were determined, um, supplies, the cost of, of cloud computing, AWS services, and that is the total adjusted ASC 730 financial statement R&D. This is how Appendix D is where the wage uh, upper level managers limit is calculated, and without going into to too much of the detail, it's, it's basically you're looking at being able to include 10% of, of upper level managers that are not direct supervisors. Typically with the credit, we only get first level supervisors included, but what has happened is that sometimes upper level managers are eligible to be included in the R&D tax credit because of their direct involvement in R&D activities. So, for example, if, if you have a, even a CEO that's also an engineer overseeing the engineering team and really involved in, in design review or coming up with conceptual development initiatives, you know, we would typically include those in the credit calculation. And it's an area that the IRS has focused on. Highly compensated employees being included in the credit creates, you know, can inflate the credit, and so that's an area of focus. So this is a way of saying we're going to give you 10%. Um, as long as there's other limitations, but in, in general, we'll give you 10%, or you know, or you're going to have to have it not be safe harbored, and it's it's open um, for further review by the IRS, and we're gonna we're gonna analyze it in more depth. So it, what this really could benefit is companies who have not traditionally claimed any of that upper level manager. Um, this might be an opportunity to get some of those costs in, um, even if they typically would not be claimed for the R&D credit. All right, and I hear that Ray is back. So I'm hoping uh, he's in a good place and the fire drill is gone, and I can turn it back to him. <laughs> Thank you, Star. Again, apologies for uh, for the interruption here. Um, so as far as, as what we were hoping to accomplish on this is just to try to give some visibility as, as to how this plays out um, with an example company. Um, comparing what would occur under the Section 41 usual R&D credit uh, analysis versus the usage of the ASC 730 directive methodology. So across the top, we've got um, what Example Inc. would be um, realizing in the form of a, of a Section 41 
um, R&D credit um, with their starting point uh, on the left side and then the resulting uh, QREs on the right. So total of, of, of costs from a Section 41 standpoint of roughly 4,600 um, and then making all of the usual adjustments that we would see for under Section 41 for anything that's outside of the U.S., um, taking the 35% haircut for any contractor costs that are qualified, and then taking uh, direct research, direct support, direct supervision, um, all at the applicable qualification rates along with the supplies that may be used and consumed during the development process. So in this example, the resulting amount for a QRE perspective is, is that $37.75. Looking at what occurs, for example, Inc. in this year, um, we see the, the roughly the same amounts um, as far as the amounts for outside the U.S., research conducted outside the U.S. Um, and those contractor costs, um, the gross amounts for the wages on, on the employees that are performing the research, along with the, the supply costs. So as far as what is going to be determined as eligible for safe harbor protection, um, you'll see that in the bottom right-hand quadrant there. Um, again, we're going to want to make the adjustment as far as backing anything out that is uh, for research performed outside of the U.S. And as we said before, for uh, safe harbor purposes, we're not allowed to include anything that is related to any contract research costs those would go into one of the other buckets that we had described in Appendix B um, for purposes of inclusion in the credit, but just not for uh, safe harbor protection. And as Star was mentioning, with respect to the qualified individual contributors and the first level supervisors, those would be included at 95% of, of their wages um, for, for those uh, resulting amounts that are listed there. Um, supplies, as we said as well, um, are eligible for safe harbor treatment. So as long as they are um, items that are used and consumed in the U.S., that's, that's one additional factor that we want to make sure that uh, is not an issue as far as anything that may potentially be used somewhere else. Factoring that in uh, and, and including only those items that are used and consumed in the U.S. Um, for, for, for this example purposes uh, was that full 400 resulting in the, in the uh, total of 40.58. So comparing between the two as far as what's resulting under ASC 730 versus what would result under the Section 41 analysis, is the, in this example, would be slightly higher. Um, and usually that's going to be attributable to uh, the amounts that the, the qualification rates that the employees are uh, able to be included at, at that 95%. Um, and in other instances that we've seen, just the as far as the the amounts of supplies that are that are included are includable um, based on the accounts that we're seeing in ASC 730. Uh, sometimes that can be a generator there as well. In the bottom right hand corner, uh, we just wanted to highlight a couple of, uh, of of thoughts as far as applying both the safe harbor uh, methodology as well as um, the additional amounts that you would be entitled to under Section 41. So if we, if we think about the directive QRE of 4058, and then in addition to that, still claiming what would be otherwise qualified under Section 41 as contract research QRE, or that 325 in the top right-hand corner, that would get us up to the 4383 amount. And then adding an additional layer onto that would be to also claim those folks, those uh, that time and, and resulting expense that is um, paid out to upper level managers um, that, that may be qualified in excess of that 10% threshold that, that Star was describing before for those upper level managers. So in this instance, we were only in the, under the directive allowed to claim 333 for the upper level managers. Let's say that there's additional upper level managers that are um, qualified in excess of that amount, you would still be able to uh, to, to um, include those that time and resulting cost in the overall R&D credit claim for the year. It just wouldn't be 
uh, protected under that safe harbor umbrella that we described in, in Appendix B. It would show up under appendix in, in, uh, in that column C or, or D um, and eventually show up on your, your 67, 65 to claim the, the overall credit. So just wanted to, to fold that in as far as um, additional options that are available to further maximize um, the, the amount that could be included and realized in, in the form of a credit. I think that brings us to our next polling question. All right. Our third question, true or false, applying for certification under the ASC 730 directive limits the amount of R&D credits a taxpayer can claim on the tax return. And your options are true or false. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them now from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slide to via email after the webcast. I'll give everyone a few more seconds here. And let's take a look at the results. Ray, back to you. Okay. So the overall limit or the overall amount of the credit that is that is realized using the directive is is not limited. Um, there are some adjustments that we described as far as how to calculate it, but as far as um, the the actual amount that is uh, that is realized using the directive, um, that is not limited. So false would be the answer. So let's see here. Oh, uh, so we have a dish. So as Star had mentioned, we this this directive uh, came out in September of, of last year, and and since then, um, there have been an additional questions and and guidance that has been uh, provided, um, either from the service or from in in the first case on our bullet point, the uh, the Franchise Tax Board of California. Um, other thought leadership as far as um, how to treat some potential uh, issues or vagaries that, that may be embedded into the directive itself. So we just wanted to highlight those really quickly um, to provide additional guidance uh, that, that is now available to us. So um, for, for state purposes, uh, the Franchise Tax Board has announced formally that, uh, that it will conform with the directive going forward. So uh, much the same that the IRS examiners are instructed to apply the directive methodology where necessary, California agents will be instructed to do the same going forward with respect to California R&D credits. Uh, the one thing that, that uh, we'll want to do to ensure there is uh, from a location standpoint um, that for those uh, individual employees as well as supplies that are utilized will want to um, specifically set out anything that is non-California based as, as non-qualified um, and, and focus solely on that, those items that are uh, in fact California based. Um, and then the second one as far as uh, prior year applicability, um, question being you know, if this methodology is available to us for say the 2017 tax year, uh, would the examiners be uh, amenable to applying that to prior years as, as well? Um, as far as the IRS is concerned, there hasn't been any black letter response to that as far as uh, the guidance that has been provided. Um, however, the, the, there has been mentioned by the service as far as the, um, the directive being uh, applied by the – that the, the examiners would be allowed to, to apply it retroactively. So um, the, the, the thought is that going to previous years would be, would be allowed and, and the examiners would be applying the, the directive methodology for those prior years as well. Another question that came up was uh, in relation to the um, mechanics of the calculation. So when we think about how you calculate an R&D credit, you're looking at two main items. One is you're looking at your, your current year spend and your current year qualified spend, um, and you're comparing that to your base period. So what, depending on which federal methodology you're using, whether that's traditional or whether that's alternative simplified, you're going to want, you're going to need to look at prior year 
uh, information, quali quantitative data as far as what that base period and what that base amount uh, amounts to um, based on, 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 the, on the company's um, R&D. Uh, so the question being, all right, well, if we're using the directive methodology for the current year, does that therefore, um, as a result of a consistency requirement, re uh, make us go back and redo our base period calculation? Um, to, to match that directive methodology that we're using in the current year. Um, and as far as we understand as of now, that, the answer to that question is no, um, that there is no need to, to go back and recalculate everything. Again, as we were saying before, the, the, the main driver um, behind this, uh, this initiative is, is, is an efficiency standpoint. Um, and so it's, it, it appears to us that the, the um, resulting calculation um, would utilize uh, the, the base period as it's been calculated already um, under the prior years for, for the company. Lastly, um, as far as the determination with respect to employees um, and the org chart that, that, that we talked about, so making that determination, well, what happens if during 2017, we've got somebody that went from an individual contributor or, um, to a first-level supervisor at, say, you know, the September mark or, or something like that. So um, what the, the, the guidance says um, to that issue is that the role itself of the employee is, is determinative, um, not the title. So what we're going to want to do is look to what the employee was doing over the course of the year um, and try to, to allocate that um, in accordance with, with that role that they're playing. So um, it's, it's, um, the, the title itself, will, uh, we would use that as, a, as an initial indicator um, as far as how to apply and think about them for purposes of the directive methodology. But it, the, the title by itself is not going to be uh, solely determined. Um, so I think I toss it back to Star to walk through a couple of scenarios that we wanted to present. Great, thanks, Ray. These are simplified scenarios, but kind of a couple that we have run into frequently and just some of the considerations that we're talking to our clients about as far as is this safe harbor right for you. Um, you know, part of the safe harbor is including um, a lot of the appendix and the certification statement with your tax return. However, the IRS has said that you do not, that is not a requirement um, to follow this directive. So you do not actually have to file the certification with the tax return. Um, you can uh, wait to get audited and then say you want to use this method. Um, you still want to be prepared with doing the calculation this way, but it's, it's important to note that um, one of the considerations or questions we've heard is, you know, do I have to supply the IRS with all this information? I would prefer not to give more information about my R&D credit claim. And the answer is you don't have to, and you can still follow this, this method and, and have it um, apply. With that, though, I'll just uh, talk through scenario one. Um, in this scenario, Company A incurred and reported $1 million of ASC 730 expenses, and it was comprised of labor and materials. So pretty straightforward, no subcontractor costs. Um, additionally, none of these expenses were outside of the United States, and they all related to development of a new product that was not under customer contract. So this is kind of the straightforward, it's all internal, it's all basically qualified. Um, you'd have to go through the calculation exercise, which is a little bit cumbersome. But it is likely that the majority of these costs will be considered safe harbored under ASC 730. So this is a case where we would recommend, yes, it, it makes sense. You should do it this way. It's what the IRS wants. It will help if there's ever an examination. And maybe um, some considerations around you know, how much you're reserving for financial statements. Um, it can help you know, with, with that determination as well. Um, as the IRS has, has said, these will be safe harbored. The second scenario I will say is more common. And this scenario is just where there's a mix of, of potential safe harbor expenses and, and a significant amount that's not safe harbored. And in this case, Company B also had a million dollars, but half of it was performed under customer contract, and the other half was improving a production process. 
Um, so improving production processes can qualify as an R&D expense as well as for the credit, um, but it is an area that the IRS looks at um, in depth and it, and it can be a little bit more challenging to support. And so in this case, you might want to say, well, it's worth getting you know, half of the cost related to this improved production process as safe harbored so that I don't have to, to deal with it during an IRS examination in depth. Um, so that's one of the considerations, but I think, you know, is it worth it? Um, is it worth the effort? Although you don't have to disclose it to the, to the IRS on your tax return that that's not a requirement, it will take some more work because in this case you'd have to approach um, the R&D credit calculation from two angles. You'd have to use the directive methodology and then you'd also have to use the standard methodology that we use for the credit. So you're actually doing an analysis in two different ways. Um, we haven't seen that it substantially increases, you know, f uh, professional fees, you know, to, to do the work because we, we are trying to make it as efficient as possible, but it, it could be a little bit more of a burden on your time to gather the, the financial information in two different ways. So that's one consideration. Is it worth the effort um, to avoid that risk? And the, the second is base threshold. You know, it might be if there's any issues or concerns with the fixed base percentage calculation from the past or the past three years if you're using the alternative simplified credit. This does not protect you from that. And so that kind of goes to that first question, is it worth the effort? This would be a consideration. Um, how good is your base threshold? If there's concerns there, does it, is that the main concern? And, and this safe harbor just isn't that beneficial. Um, and there are the, uh, another major consideration is the amount of potential upside. This we have seen in some instances that this that this can increase credits um, because of the approach with with classifying something in its ASC 730, uh, especially when it comes to labor, is an all or nothing. You don't generally see that 50% of someone's time is included. Um, usually, it's 100 or zero. Whereas with the credit calculation, we would look at it what percentage of time, and so they might end up being 50% qualified if we if we did it the traditional route. So there is a potential to to get more expenses included um, using this, and also get those expenses safe harbored. So that's a that's one of the considerations. That brings us to, I believe, our last polling question. Yep, our final polling question, uh, true or false, applying for certification under this directive will safe harbor a taxpayer's base amount calculation for purposes of the R&D tax credit. And your options are true or false. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the certification widget to the right of the slide view. I'll give everyone a few more seconds to make a selection. And let's take a look at the results. Star, back to you. Great, thanks Emily. So it looks about split, I know this is confusing, but the, the safe harbor does not apply to the base amount calculation. So this is false. So that is a separate consideration um, that you want to take into account. It does not eliminate the risk of your base getting adjusted by the IRS, which could mean that you have safe harbored expenses, but if the IRS does not agree with your base calculation, your credit could still be disallowed. So it is a separate determination and an important one. So that brings us to our final slide, just some takeaways. Um, I know this is a lot of detail. There's a lot of calculation uh, work involved in, in claiming the credit under this directive, but it is a benefit. Um, it's, it's been several years in the works with the IRS and practitioners, and it's really a way of streamlining the audit process for both taxpayers and for the IRS. So just some key takeaways. This directive can provide an extra safeguard with respect to IRS exam adjustments, so it can help really focus on what the IRS is going to be focused on and take some amount of the, of the expenses being claimed off the table from an IRS um, adjustment standpoint. In some scenarios, there is a potential for higher credits claimed under this method. We've already seen this several times. Ac 
accurate reporting of ASC 730 on financial statements is key to effectiveness. And so if, if you think this is something that might benefit your company, now's the time to maybe reevaluate, are you classifying the right expenses as ASC 730? And are you looking at it um, as in-depth as you should? And if the answer is no, it might be a good time to talk um, internally or with, with um, your tax and assurance uh, contacts um, or firm to, to really understand what should be going into there. And the last one is, is that really this whole, I, the, it's a long way of saying it, it relies on the principles that if you identify an, uh, activities as ASC 730 and it, they're audited by your financial statement auditors and found to be materially correct, then it, it, it not meets the definition under the tax code, uh, Internal Revenue Code, uh, Section 174. That is the real basis of all this, is it's, it's just saying from an IRS risk standpoint, they're just saying that these are just not risky activities to be looking at for IRS exam. That brings us to any questions you have. If you haven't put your questions in your Q&A, um, in the Q&A, please do so now. All right. Thanks. Star, let's see, we have some questions. We've got some time for questions. If you have a question that you would like us to address, you can enter that in the Q&A window under the slide view, uh, you, or you may reach out directly to Star or Ray. And our first question, will this method reduce professional fees with respect to the R&D tax credit analysis? I can take that one, and I think um, we just covered this as well um, in a previous slide, but it, it can, um, but not necessarily. It can actually, depending on how much will be safe harbored versus non-safe harbored, you could end up with additional fees. Um, however, you would, I guess the, the upside of that would be that you would get uh, some of the costs safe harbored, and, and that might have other implications and, and benefits. And so... Um, it's really, it just depends on, on the fact pattern. If it's completely safe harbored R&D, um, this might you know, actually reduce fees um, slightly. Thank you. Our next question, how many years back can we use this method? Ray, do you want to take that one? Sure. So, yeah, as we, I think we covered this in the slides as well as far as the ability to go back. Um, so it, just, it depends solely on, on, on the um, data that you have as far as the audited financials and the supporting detail. Um, so um, they're, they're, as far as the, the actual number, I don't know that there's a, there's a specific um, uh, number of years that, that you can go back, but that is something that we have uh, understood to be the case as far as the having that ability to look at prior years as far as the, the resulting credit that would, uh, that would come about utilizing the, the directive methodology. Thanks, Ray. Uh, looks like we have a couple more questions. Are the ASC 350 expenses not eligible for the directive calculation? They are not. So internal use software, you can still include it in your credit calculation if it qualifies. It just would not be considered safe harbored. Internal use software is also historically a, a focus of the IRS, so they intentionally they want um, to look at that a little bit more in depth and do not want it part of the safe harbor. Thank you. Um, our next question. We have a CPA reviewed financial statement and take R&D expenses. Is there any benefit to us disclosing the R&D credit on our external CPA statement? I think there potentially could be. I mean, work with your uh, whoever's your CPA who's doing the review. But I, I, the IRS is preferring this method. It's actually easier for them. So even if you have reviewed financial statements and you're not, it's not a guarantee you're going to get safe harbored. Following this methodology will likely help um, if there is a, an exam and you offer it up to the IRS examiners, hey, we've, even though we don't have 
um, audited financials, we still identified R&D expenses and had them reviewed. And I, I think that that could uh, have some potential benefits in an IRS exam. Thank you. Uh, I see that W-2 wages are listed. How do associated benefits and expenses, expenses such as FICA, retirement con contributions, et cetera, play into that equation? Ray? Yeah, I can take that one, sir. Um, so the, our, our W-2 box one number is going to be our starting point. Um, that's something that we we know from the, so the R&D credit regulations. Um, so utilizing that amount, that's going to take a number of components um, that are typically included in gross wages out of the calculation. So one of those that, that I specifically see in your note as far as retirement contributions, anything 401k related is going to be pulled out of that. Um, so as far as, as the starting point is concerned, we, we really do look um, to that box one W-2 number, um, both for the R&D credit uh, calculation under section 41, um, as well as, as how we end up uh, calculating the wage QRE component of, of the directive methodology as well. Thanks, Ray. Looks like we have uh, one more question. In general, if you have a uh, mix of U.S. employees, out-of-country R&D, and R&D contractor, is that correct to say traditional calculation is easier? Um, not necessarily. Um, you have to remove those items. Well, besides the contract, you'd have to remove any out-of-country from the traditional calculation as well, so you'd have to identify those. It really would come down to how you, how you're tracking the R&D expenses. If you're doing it by general ledger account, um, identifying R&D general ledger accounts, then it might be easier to actually use this directive methodology. If you're doing project costing or other um, ways of, of capturing expenses, then you know it might make more sense to do the traditional. Um, so I, I think they both, you know, they both come with with different co uh, uh, concerns or, or complications, but. Um, I don't know that one would be easier than the other, uh, except for the fact, you know, if you have a large contractor cost, it just might might not, might not make sense to use the directive if that's the you know your primary expense, um, because you won't have any safe harbor at the end of the day. Great, thank you, Star. Uh, I think that was all we have for questions. Uh, if you think of something after the webcast, um, feel free to reach out to Star or Ray. Um, and thank you, Star and Ray, for a great presentation today. Um, thank you, everyone on the line, for bearing with us during the fire drill. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you'll join us again next time.